later today up on our uh, website a listing of 99 cases. I do apologize that we haven't been able to get that updated for you yet, but it will be up later today. Um, those are uh, the cases that were reported to us as of yesterday at 5 p.m. Um, that is an additional 11 over yesterday. And then on top of that, we've had an additional six cases reported this morning, um, <clears throat> taking us to a total of 105. And um, as per usual, we won't be able to give you detailed information on those cases until tomorrow to allow ourselves the time to investigate them. Um, I'll walk through uh, verbally a bit more information than I usually do about the individual cases because we don't have the summary up for you uh, to view. But if you look at, if you imagine being able to see them all, um, we've got people between the ages of their 20s through to their 90s. Um, one individual in their 20s, one in their 30s, um, the rest in their 60s, 80s, or 90s. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the locations are all in Simcoe, Muskoka, except for uh, one individual, um, a woman in her 60s from Gravenhurst. Um, there are no individuals that have been hospitalized. They're all recovering either in their home or in um, the, <clears throat> the uh, Bradford Valley uh, senior home, uh, of which we have an additional five uh, senior, uh, five residents from that facility uh, added to the list. And um, I would also say that uh, the uh, that four of the cases were um, acquired through travel and two were acquired in the community and two were close contacts of other cases and then I'd already indicated that uh, five are part of um, the outbreak that's happening at Bradford Valley. Um, I think I'll walk through some additional information with regards to the two senior home outbreaks. There are no additional reported cases for Spencer House, so uh, all we've had to date is, is the one staff person who was working well transmissible. And so far to date, none of the individual staff or residents that have been tested at that facility have been found to be positive for COVID. Um, and with regard to Bradford Valley, um, as I've indicated, we have an additional five residents that have tested to be positive. Um, that makes a total of 14 residents that have tested positive, as well as an additional staff member. So that's two, two staff. The, the additional staff members among the uh, uh, additional six cases that have come in since five o'clock last night, and thus I'd be able to give more information tomorrow about that individual, along with the other six that I've already cited. Um, none of the cases uh, associated with Bradford Valley have had to be hospitalized. Um, they've been uh, relatively mild to date, which of course is a very good thing. Just um, looking to some key messages that I want to give. As always, I emphasize the importance of community transmission, of people assuming that um, it's transmitting in their community, that therefore they need to be um, taking the precautions of physical distancing, two meters away from other individuals, avoiding crowds, hand washing frequently, um, thinking carefully about whether or not you really need to go out, limiting the number of times that you go out. Um, some ad additional information I would give or emphasize right now is that people should probably be planning about their outings and um, minimizing them. So people need to go out to shop for food or they need to go out to buy medications. Um, they should plan around doing that f as few times as they can manage in order to reduce the number of exposures or potential exposures that they could have when they're going out. Um, and um, those who are above the age of 70, the chief uh, medical officer of health of the provinces advised 
that they self-isolate at home and arrange for other people to do these things for them, to do their shopping for them if at all possible. And there are services available on 211 uh, to potentially help them or they could draw upon assistance of family and friends to do so, provided that they maintain the two meter distance. Um, anybody that's developed any symptoms of respiratory illness or mild illness should assume that they've got it, put themselves into uh, self-isolation for a 14-day period, monitor themselves, and seek medical attention if they develop severe symptoms such as shortness of breath. Or if they're a healthcare worker, they should be seeking testing before returning to work and be off a minimum of 14 days regardless. Um, just a few other key points that I would have. Yeah, I do feel it's important, of course, for people to take care of your mental health and your physical health and these restrictions that we've placed um, to prevent the spread of this virus, to flatten the curve, are hard on people. And so um, I would suggest that you need to be reaching out with uh, distance technology to stay in touch with friends and family and think about how you would exercise. Exercise is a reason to go out, but you do, do need to be practicing that physical distancing. And um, you probably need to think about your route now because many places have been closed uh, to public access as part of the response to COVID-19. Um, just a few things. Um, we talked yesterday about masks. I, I emphasize um, the importance of uh, safeguarding for healthcare workers access to masks that are used in healthcare environments. So that would be surgical masks and procedure masks and N95 masks. Um, they're all critically important for healthcare workers to have at this time when we have a shortage. The province is um, seeking to procure more masks and there was a shipment that was allowed in from the United States, which is very good, of N95 masks. And the province is now looking to healthcare facilities to be conserving masks and to be um, saving discarded masks for repurposing uh, purposes, um, re-sterilization and use. So that is uh, something that's underway to um, avoid a complete loss of masks. And I did talk yesterday about um, cloth masks. There was um, the identification of new recommendations from Theresa Tam, the Chief Public Health Officer of Canada, who stated that um, homemade cloth masks could, could be used by people who, when they are out and seeking to do social distancing, find they're in an environment where it's difficult to do so. Um, and thus, wearing a cloth mask might help prevent transmission to another person. So if you wear a cloth mask, it helps prevent um, you from uh, giving somebody else uh, COVID-19. It may be that you have minimal or no symptoms. It, it's possible to have this infection without symptoms. And so um, you could still be uh, infectious to other people even though you don't have symptoms. And if you wear this kind of a mask, it can help protect them from you giving it to them. So that is something that people could consider. Dr. Tam <clears throat> didn't say that it was actually a recommendation. It was merely an option for people at this time. Um, but that would be no substitute for people exercising physical distancing. Um, and uh, right back to the importance of people keeping a two meter distance and avoiding crowds and hand washing. And one of the downsides of wearing a mask is that you might um, inadvertently contaminate your hands by handling the mask and you could actually give yourself an infection by touching then your eyes um, or touching surfaces that could lead to infection for other people. Um, so uh, it's um, definitely not a, a strong recommendation for people to be using homemade masks at this time. Um, uh, we've also had questions about the use of gloves. So. Uh, for example, it's been reported that uh, people are food handlers who are delivering food, such as home delivery pizza, the, the, um, the delivery person might be wearing gloves. And that would be absolutely no um, substitute for hand washing. If you wear gloves, you are impeded from washing your hands and people tend not to wear the gloves, or sorry, they tend not to 
clean the gloves. You should really, I would suggest you don't use gloves at all. In fact, you should just be repeatedly um, washing your hands, whether or not you're a food service provider or anyone else in the community. That's uh, a really good way to help reduce transmission to other people from you and to protect yourself from a transmission as well. Better to dispense with the gloves if it's out in the community and wash your hands frequently. Um, this is not to be confused with healthcare workers in a healthcare environment when they are wearing the full personal protective equipment, when working directly with patients who have uh, COVID-19. In those instances, they, they do need a gown and gloves as well as mask and eye protection. Um, just looking down my list here of other things. There was a question here about people in a nursing home wing that's tested positive for COVID-19 and should the staff on the wing be issued N95 masks? So healthcare workers can be using N95 masks or surgical masks or procedure masks, depending on the situation that they're dealing with. For most um, encounters with patients with um, COVID-19, um, they really need a surgical mask or a procedure mask. This is a disease, it's what we call droplet transmitted, aerosol droplets that can settle out within one or at most two meters from the patient. And um, so um, for most patient encounters, those masks are sufficient. N95 masks are more protective, but they are really reserved for um, airborne infectious diseases. So there's some diseases that um, transmit farther into the air and remain suspended in the air much longer. They're called airborne infectious diseases and uh, measles would be a good example of that. And for those diseases, you need a higher um, effectiveness mask, the N95 mask that does a, um, a better, more thorough job of filtering out the air. Um, and so that mask should be used when providing certain type of care to COVID-19 positive patients. Um, if you're providing or patient, um, healthcare workers are providing care that um, results in um, a exposure to the airway and a, a coughing from the airway, uh, for example, putting in an end endotracheal tube uh, to put them on a ventilator or doing um, resuscitation to try and revive them and bring them back to life with heavy chest compressions or airway management, um, then there's much greater potential for the, the providers of the care to get exposed to um, the respiratory uh, droplets from the patients. So they need an N95 mask under those conditions. So I guess that's a long answer to your question, but the, but the short answer would be almost always for those staff working in a, um, in a, uh, a uh, say a long-term care facility or nursing home with an outbreak, they don't need the N95 mask. They do need a surgical mask or a procedure mask. Now there's another question here that's related to that and it says, should staff in retirement homes be wearing masks as a precaution to protect their residents? And in fact, we from the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit have cited some recommendations that have come from uh, the Ontario Health Agency um, a couple of weeks ago um, that recommend what we call universal masking, which is the use of masks, surgical masks or procedure masks by staff in all, all the time that they're working in a healthcare setting. So. Uh, throughout the day, throughout their shift, when they're working in a healthcare setting, that they wear a mask all the time, um, with the exception of if they've gone for a break and are away from the care environment and they're having lunch. But other than that, wearing a mask all, all the time. And that is because of asymptomatic infections or infections that can occur with transmission from people who don't have symptoms. We know now that that can happen with this disease. And so to protect both the patients or the residents, if it's a long-term care facility, and also to provide some protection to healthcare workers. Healthcare workers we're recommending should be wearing um, a mask throughout uh, their work shift. Uh, we do realize that there's a shortage of masks now and that um, complicates the picture of being able to do that. 
Um, we are familiar with mask conserving practices in uh, healthcare settings that can try and deal with both challenges, the protection with the wearing of the mask, but reducing the uh, number of masks that are used um, per uh, staff member per day. So wearing the same mask throughout the shift or wearing up to two masks per shift can help achieve both ends of protecting everybody while conserving masks. So um, at this point, I just want to make sure that I've covered everything. Um, okay, I think I've covered my bases. So at this point, I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, um, let's start with Mandy. Do you have a question, Mandy? Hi there. Um, I have a question about the uh, hospitalized cases, Dr. Gardner. You said, I believe you said all of these new ones, none of them have been hospitalized. That's true. Do you have any updates on the people who were hospitalized or are still currently? So, um, we've got, so far of those who have been hospitalized, two have recovered, five have deceased, seven are in the intensive care unit, and five are in a hospital, but not in the intensive care unit. <clears throat> And what hospitals are they at right now? I don't need specific one by one, just list uh, the hospital. Uh, okay. Let me just um, work my way through my database. They are, or they have been, and well, even at this time, at this point in time, are at Soldiers Memorial Hospital, RVH. Um, South Lake Regional Health Center, Muskoka Algonquin Hospital Corporation, and Stevenson Memorial Hospital. Awesome. And one last follow-up question. There is a doctor at Stevenson Memorial Hospital, um, Dr. Kabusi, who has taken it upon himself to build these uh, intubation tubes. I'm wondering if you've heard of them um, and if any of them have been put into hospitals here. I'm afraid I don't have any information about that. That would be new for me. But I thank you okay, for that. Thank you. Okay. James Fuller, do you have a question? Yep. Hi there. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to confirm, I think I heard this correctly, but I just want to make sure. Uh, did you say there was only one case in Muskoka and it was a Gravenhurst woman in her 60s? Yes, out of the new cases. <clears throat> Fantastic. Uh, my other question is to do with the, you were mentioning gloves, uh, especially in food service, and I noticed a couple of times, you know, uh, food service personnel wearing gloves, uh, taking money, and then also giving the food out. And I'm just wondering if there's any kind of education opportunity here from the health unit or how you guys might police this, because it seems like a bit of a cross-contamination issue. I agree. I, I personally don't think it's a good practice at all with using gloves in that environment in that way. It'd be far better that they not use gloves and frequently wash their hands. Um, I think we'll take it under advisement to look at the potential to raise awareness in businesses about that at this time. It's certainly an important time to, to raise this matter. Thank you. Nathan Schubert, do you have a question? Uh, yes, good afternoon. I just wanted to talk a bit more about uh, not really using gloves. So is there really any situation where gloves could be seen as beneficial? compared to uh, hand washing or not really? So in the healthcare environment, providing care for one patient who has an infectious disease uh, that's transmissible, um, they, uh, part of the personal protective equipment includes gloves. It's used for that care of that patient. And then as part of um, uh, moving on to the care of others, all of that personal protective equipment is carefully removed and then the hands are washed and it's disposed of. So that gives you a good idea, I think, as to what is a helpful use of gloves or used for one instance of care in a healthcare environment of, of, of a patient in a very careful way. So um, beyond that, use for infection control in the community, um, it probably isn't helpful because it, it's 
It's tended to use much more than just for one instance of, of a service with one individual. It's not as though they're, they're changing their gloves with every, every instance of, of uh, service provision. I think it would be much better if, in fact, they didn't wear them and they washed their hands frequently instead. You're welcome. Do you have a follow-up question, Nathan? Uh, I do not. Thank you. Okay, thanks. How about you, Doug Cross? Hello. Uh, so we've gotten a, a report into our office uh, from someone in the Skoka community who is in a large apartment building. Someone's returned from the U.S. Uh, not self-isolating, coming and going, shopping, etc. A lot of people concerned. Police were called several times and reportedly the response was what we want us to do about it. Well, what what does someone who is concerned about examination, etc., what what's the best course of action? Is it the police? Is it contacting your office to give the information? Because I think they're feeling a little fucked if in the building of fifty people that someone may be walking around and uh, it's not abiding by the regulations. Well, thank you very much for that. Clearly, I would be very concerned about that, and I would want enforcement to happen. It does fall under the Federal uh, Quarantine Act, which speaks to something called peace officers um, to enforce the legislation. And our understanding is that does include police, and it does not include public health. We are actually uh, empowered to enforce the provincial directives that have been issued um, with regards to the, the closure of uh, non-essential work environments, including sit-down restaurant locations. Uh, and we are prepared to work with the police and uh, between us enforce, um, and as we would sort out between them. Um, what I would suggest is um, people can certainly call us and we would certainly follow up with the police and work out how enforcement would happen. And I do appreciate you letting me know about the experience that you've had as well. We are reaching out to police at this time, various police departments throughout Simcoe Muskoka, to work out an understanding about this. I see. So, um, and if someone's calling your office, are we still looking at long wait times? Uh, that? It's much better than it was. The volume of calls has fallen quite substantially. Um, so I would anticipate that you would have a much better time of it than you would have, say, two weeks ago, a week ago. Tremendous. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. How about uh, Don Huddlestone? Hi. Thank you. Um, my question relates to the OPP as well, but um, from a first responder type perspective, we have, um, you know, we've talked a lot about personal protective equipment for healthcare workers, but do you have any information on what's happening with police officers in particular, because they're often coming into close contact, so are there measures being taken for them to either not transmit infections to people or to prevent getting infected themselves? So um, I don't have as good a handle on that myself, uh, so that is something I need to look into. Um, what I would recommend for them is that they do the social distancing. Of course, that's going to be a limited um, ability for them to do. Uh, I do know that ambulance attendants are very well equipped with personal protective equipment, including N95 masks. Um, but I'm not, it's not clear to me about the police or the fire department. Um, I do believe from some communications I've had that they do keep on hand um, masks, surgical masks. Um, and uh, I would be recommending um, at this time that if they're coming within two meters of uh, someone as part of their work, it probably is a good idea for them to be using that um, because after the fact, uh, they, they don't know what kind of exposure they would have had or if the individual in question was, was uh, carrying COVID or not. Um, and um, we just got a directive from the province indicating that for, um, the... Um, uh, um, operators for uh, first responders are able to obtain the test results on individuals that they've um, uh, come in contact with through their work um, in order to find out whether or not they'd had an exposure. So that 
that is something new for them to get information to determine whether or not they've had an exposure. So from a teleconference that I attended this morning, which included a laboratory report, um, they are indeed still caught up. Wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Erica Engel. Yes, um, I just need to clarify the numbers. Um, so you have 87 cases listed on the website. Yesterday you said there were another 11 not posted, which brings the total to 98. And then you said six more cases this morning. So is it 104 or 105? So what? Okay, what else? let's stick with what I got in front of me here. So what you have up on our website right now needs to be updated. When it's finished, yeah. you'll have a total of 99 listed. Um, and there'll be an, 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 another six that we weren't able to get up today or won't be able to get up today because they came in um, after five o'clock yesterday and need to be investigated. So therefore the total is 105. Okay, could you um, run through the location of the up to 99, like the, from your website has 87, so from yeah. 87 to 99. So, Number 87, New Tecumseth, 88, New Tecumseth, 89, New Tecumseth, 90, Gravenhurst. I see that I made an error. Earlier I said there was only one from Muskoka. There's actually two from Muskoka. So two from Gravenhurst, I apologize. Um, 90, Bradford, West Gwillenbury, 9, sorry, 91, Bradford, West Gwillenbury, 92, Bradford, 93, Bradford, 94, Bradford, 95, Bradford, 96, Penetanguishene, 97, Midland, 98, Gravenhurst, and 99, Bradford. And do you have a follow-up, Erica? I do. I uh, actually spoke with someone this morning in Collingwood who has um, confirmed positive for COVID, and mm -hmm. he actually said um, he believes he got it from, from speaking to a person who had actually recovered and that they were practicing physical distancing while they were speaking. So he mm -hmm. sort of um, concerned that people might not understand that even if you're practicing physical distancing, distancing there's still a risk you could transmit. Um, just wondered if you wanted to comment on that. People are thinking, you know, mm -hmm. maybe I can go for a walk. Uh, as long as I stay far apart from the person I'm walking with. Maybe you want to be a little more specific on that? So, of course, people um, always have their suspicions about how they, they got something if they don't know for sure. Um, we do know from the best of our research that two meters distance is highly protective. It won't be perfect, but it's highly protective. Um, we uh, do know um, that a full recovery, 14 days, um, is highly protective as well, though not absolutely perfect. There can be um, the very occasional individual that continues to shed virus after that time. It's not clear even then whether or not they're infectious because the levels are very low when they continue to do that. That is, by the way, one of the reasons why we have healthcare workers be tested um, after they've recovered uh, to have a negative test, two negative tests before they go back to work. Um, so, it's, we also know that there is community transmission happening right now. There's, there are people who are asymptomatic who can be transmitting, and it's entirely possible that this, in this case of transmission that you're referring to, this individual got it from somebody else who is, simply didn't have symptoms or wasn't apparent to them, and um, uh, thus they had their exposure and got their infection. We'll never know for sure. That person will never know for sure. It really goes back to the importance of practicing the, the social distancing to the utmost. I just met 
sorry, um, further to that, mm -hmm. um, what about people who, are, who think, well, I want to go for a walk or have, like, drive lizards with my neighbor as long as we're two meters apart, is it safe? So, so far I'm still saying people can go for a walk. I am aware that the Premier has been saying people should not go out at all, um, but um, that is not regulation as yet. It may come to that, but it's not regulation as yet. So I'm still saying that it's important for people to get exercise, um, and it's important for their mental health as well. But when they do so, they need to give distance to other people. It needs to be two meters or more. And um, if they have an encounter with a neighbor, they need to maintain that two meter distance or more. And um, I probably, I think it's wise for people to limit the number of times they go out. If you're gonna do this, do it once, don't do it multiple times. If you need to shop, why don't you plan so that you only have to do it once a week. Um, I think shopping in some ways would be higher risk because you're going into a, uh, a building with many other people and you can do your best to maintain distance but um, there's still the potential for with more people in there to have an encounter and there are surfaces that you're you're going to be touching you'll need to be washing your hands um, so caution about the number of times you go shopping or go into a premise somewhere I think outdoors you're probably safer but even so you want to limit the number of times that you go out in a day Uh, Dr. Gardner, can you just uh, confirm the number of cases at the Bradford uh, Valley uh, long-term care facility? Um, it's just a, a bit confused. It, it, it's, so it's 16, 14 residents and two staff, is that correct? We have 14 residents testing positive to date. Five of them were in the last... Let me just make sure I've got this right for you. Five of them, say, one for the second. Okay, 14 residents in the past, uh, in total, um, and two staff in total. So this is what you got in total. I think earlier I said there were five residents that are new. I apologize. Four, four new residents and one staff that are new. So five individuals, four of them are residents and one is a staff. That's right. Okay, wonderful. I uh, just uh, wanted to make sure. And um, were you able to uh, to identify uh, the cause of the outbreak in uh, in Bradford yet? I know you were saying yesterday uh, you suspected uh, that it would be staff related, mm -hmm. um, but were you able to confirm that? I'm highly suspicious that it is. That is how these things happen. We do have a staff member who is a case to begin with. We have an additional staff member under investigation right now. Um, staff are the ones who come into these facilities. We don't have visitors coming in. It is the way in which these things are now happening. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone on the call that um, came on late that we missed? Sorry? Sorry, who is this? Mike from CTV. Oh, hi, Mike. Go ahead, please. Yeah, Doctor, uh, just if we can go by that uh, table, too, that's on the website. How many cases have recovered since yesterday? So that information I don't have at my disposal right now. Are we going to have that by end of day? Uh, no. Tomorrow is when I would get back to you. Uh, community transmission, has that ramped up? So just, just to be clear... Just to be clear, we've had two individuals who've recovered while hospitalized. And in total, we've had 25 individuals who've, sorry, 29 individuals who've recovered. But I don't, I don't have any information about specific uh, cases or which ones recovered uh, in the last 24 hours. I don't have that information. But of the 105, 29 recovered. I'm sorry, could you raise, could you say that again? Of the 105, 29 recovered is the most up to date we have? Yep, that's what we have. Okay, and hospitalizations remain at five? 
Um, we've had five deaths. We've had... Um, We've had a total of 21 hospitalizations. Okay. What's your message to the public right now? Uh, are you pleased with what you're seeing? No, I'm concerned with what I'm seeing. We're continuing to have cases. We've had a substantial number of cases even in the last 24 hours. There is evidence of community-wide transmission and people uh, need to be exercising the social distancing precautions. Uh, we are expecting this to continue to rise through um, perhaps the month of April. Uh, our task at hand is to do all we can together to flatten the curve, reduce community transmission. We still expect that rise to continue, uh, at least to some degree. Um, our goal is to flatten it so that it doesn't overwhelm the healthcare system, but I'd say I remain concerned. Thank you. Okay, You're thank welcome. you. Anybody else? Thank you very much for joining us, and uh, we will see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.